Micro mouse seems like a little miniaturized, tiny little mouse that runs around people's toes or something. The what? The <laughs> micro mouse is my little, little teddy mouse. bear at home. <laughs> no, I think it has something to do, certainly, with uh, Toys R Us. The what? This is um, a micro mouse. It's a self-contained robot. <clears throat> it's in somewhat intelligent. The intelligence lies here in this computer board. Uh, it, can, it can see, in a sense, with sensors that are all around this area here, finds out where it is. This is placed in a maze, some nine feet square. And um, it negotiates the maze. It finds its way around the maze without the help of any a remote control, radio control, any kind of outside interference. It's driven by a set of batteries like these, which fit right in here. You place it down at the beginning of the maze, push a button, and away it goes. And if you're lucky, it will solve the maze and uh, return to run again even faster and hopefully win the race. Um, this thing is about, oh, I don't know, there's some limitations on about 10, 10 inches. Um, long, 10 inches wide, and so forth. Otherwise, they come in all kinds of sizes and shapes. Now, this whole pro this is the third mouse that Cal State students have ever produced. Uh, there's a fourth one now, based on a kit that we bought when we took this one to Japan last year. Uh, but this is the third one, probably the best we've had. <laughs> I'd like to tell you a little about the history of Micromouse intercollegiate competition from our perspective here in Southern California. It started sometime around 1978 when Randy Baker, who was then a senior in electrical engineering here at Cal State LA, had seen the competition at Westcon in Los Angeles and decided there was room for an intercollegiate competition. He had a vision that this could grow into a major countrywide activity. The schools were Cal State Los Angeles and Cal State Fullerton. Miles Tweet, a student at Cal State Fullerton, was able to put together a team. That particular year, neither one of the entries was able to run the maze. And I should emphasize that was a much simpler and smaller maze than the one we're dealing with today. Other schools joined the fold, and the competition really started going. We had Cal State Long Beach, Cal Poly Pomona, UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara, and Pierce College. All of these had teams. Very few of the mice finished, but it was the start of the competition that has now built to a very high level of interest in Southern California. Many years ago, where Randy Breaker was a former student of Cal State LA, where he um, read an article in the Spectrum magazine, which is an IEEE publication, where he got the idea of, where he read that, it talked about the amazing Micro Mouse, where there was a national competition where many people from industry competed. And it was from this magazine, IEEE Spectrum, that uh, we got the idea, that he got the idea to start a Micro Mouse on Cal State LA that he wanted a competition on an intercollegiate level, a level where students could participate and learn from building a robotic micromouse that has the ability to solve a maze. And then it goes back a few years ago, and then as he graduated, the project, he spent two years on it, but because he graduated, we were still working on the mouse. And what made it so difficult is that we never had um, a blueprint. We never had... Um, the actual schematics on how to build a micro mouse. The first question is, how do we build a micro mouse? And that was the hardest thing. So what we did is that over our time, we just had to get all the information we could find through journals, through magazines, talking to people in industry. We went through all the resources we could find in trying to build a micro mouse. And then over the time period that 
he graduated, then another person took his place, and his name was Nick Ephivalos. And he's the person who was a go-getter. He would take things in his hands and just do it. He wouldn't wait for things to happen, but he would do it. And he started building the first hardware of the Micromouse, whereas Randy had the conception, the idea, but it was Nick Ephivalos that started the hardware and started building a Micromouse. And since because we didn't know how to build one, we made many, many mistakes. It took over a time period of two, three, four years. And then it got to the point where he finally had a hardware package, but it didn't work. It had problems. It has a lot of problems. And, um, but by then, though, it was time for Nick to graduate, and that's when I came in. And um, I was uh, around with him at that time, worked with him for about a year, and uh, I learned a lot from him. And then when he graduated, then I took over the project, and then I say, hey, we got to build a Micromouse. It was my goal to build a functional Micromouse before I graduated. And then I took the project from there and finished up what Nick started. I made some hardware changes, some design changes, and built it up from, the, from where he left off and made a functional Micromouse in a complete package. And that's where we got today. We have a Micromouse that, our first Micromouse from Cal State LA that ever really worked. I learned about the microprocessors and uh, programming, software and hardware. So my next step in uh, furthering my knowledge is to apply these uh, knowledges and that's why uh, I got involved with the Micromouse. But my ultimate goal is at the uh, Android, so this like Micromouse is like a starting point of my dream. I got involved in Micromouse because it gives me an opportunity to um, experience some of the things real engineers go through, such as working with the team and actual hands-on experience with a lot of equipment. Um, also interfacing hardware and software was very interesting in this project. I'm going to try to explain what we call the algorithm, which is nothing more than a set of rules that the mouse follows as it tries to get through the maze. Uh, the start on the flow chart does not mean this start. It means this is the start of the series of steps that it's going to go through for any square that it happens to be in, right? If it happens to be in this square, whatever, it'll start the same place. It reads its sensors. It is just pulled into this square, let's say, all right? It's got to find out where the walls are, obviously. So it checks its sensors, left, right, and front, okay? Uh, and that's what this says, isolate sensors. Uh, it makes a note of the way it entered, the, the side through which it entered, because if it can't proceed, that's the side it leaves from. That's when it retreats. In other words, it always goes out the back door. And I define the back door as the same entrance as it initially came in into the square. So in this case, if it's uh, here, the back door is this one. 
Here it's this one. If it enters a square here from this side, then this is the back door. Okay. Uh, then it stores the wall information in its memory, orienting it in memory so that it's uh, in terms of north, south, east, and west. So it basically keeps a compass in its mind, um, as well as it keeps a set of coordinates so it knows always exactly where it is. Okay. Then it asks, I'm in this new square now. Have I reached the goal? Since it knows exactly where it is, uh, it quickly answers yes or no. And most of the time, the answer is no. So then it goes through this part of the algorithm. It creates an exit priority. In other words, if it can get out forward, there's a certain priority attached to that, depending on whether that takes it closer to the middle or not. And the same with left and right and so forth. All right, then it asks, are there any legal exits? That is, any way can it get out where there is not a wall blocking it? And if the answer is yes, then it rotates around until it faces the exit with the highest priority. That, in other words, the one that's going to take its closest to the center. <clears throat> All right, once it's done that, it previews the next square. Let's say that it's right here. It's decided to go into this square because it takes it closer to the center. Looks in there first to see if it's been there before. It will never go into a square again that it's been in unless it's retreating. All right? If it has been there before, the answer is yes. It goes back and checks to see if there are any other legal exits. Any other exits. Um, it looks around, and finally, if it finds one that is OK, it leads to a, a previously unexplored square, then it will move to that square. All right. Then it, it actually physically moves at this point and uh, goes back up again to the top of the algorithm. All right, new square, run through the whole chart again. Uh, each time it reaches a square, it leaves behind a number in memory. In other words, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, assuming that it went that way, 7, 8. Now it's gone into this new square. Maybe there was a wall separating that. That's 9. After it's done its exploratory run, it will go through a second time and just follow, forget about testing sensors, creating priorities. It just follows the numbers. All right, And occasionally, it may find a shortcut. But if it doesn't, it merely follows the numbers till it reaches the goal. And we hope does that in the least amount of time. with MicroMouse. I ran the first MicroMouse contest that was held in the United States way back in 1979. In 1983, we received a call from the Japanese. The Computer Society did because they had heard, the Japanese had heard that the Computer Society knew all about MicroMouse. Well, somebody unfortunately remembered that I had run a MicroMouse contest. The next thing we knew, the Japanese were encouraging us to hold the United States contest. It seems that MicroMouse indeed was not dead. It had been running at Euromicro every year since 1980 and still runs in Europe. As far as industry is concerned, uh, design programs such as the MicroMouse are very helpful in helping students to uh, solve real-life problems that would be encountered when they eventually graduate and do go into the industry environment. Uh, one thing besides just teaching them and helping them to develop their technical skills, it also helps them to develop their interpersonal relationship skills those being the ability to work as a team, the ability to set schedules and meet schedules, the ability to work within uh, budgets. Uh, all these skills are necessary when working in industry and trying to uh, take problems that are presented to uh, real life engineers and uh, provide the engineering solutions to these problems uh, during the day-to-day -day working relationships. Uh, one advantage to uh, the state college system is that it tends to 
provide graduates that have a very good practical background. It's very essential to be able to work as a team. Uh, no project is done by one person. Uh, most projects are conceptualized possibly by a, a program office or a group, but then it takes a team of technical people uh, with different areas of expertise to put that program together to bring it to uh, some logical conclusion and to put it into practice. I grow mouse, yeah! Michael Mouse is like a starting point of my dream. I grow mouse! These are things that I do not learn in the classroom and that I have learned, I think, pretty well through the uh, time that I spent on this team. Thank you. 